Ms Orr. Commissioner, the next witness is Mr Angus Gilfillan. Yes, Mr Gilfillan. Ms. Harris? Uh, I dearly hope so, Commissioner. So do I. On his way in. Mr. Gilfillan, do come in and you wouldn't mind just standing in the witness box a moment. Do you uh, want to take an oath or would you prefer to make an affirmation, Mr. Gilfillan? Uh, oath would be fine. Yes. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth will be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Gilfillan. Phil and do sit down. Yes, Ms. Harris. Mr. Gilfill and your full name is Ms. Harris, how long do you expect to examine in chief for uh, less than a minute. Um, I just want to tender his statement, Commissioner. You can have a minute, Ms. <laughs> Harris. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, uh, your name is Angus Struan Christopher Gilfillan, is that correct? That's correct. And your business address is 700 Burke Street, Melbourne, Victoria? Yes. And you are currently the Executive General Manager, Consumer Lending in the Customer Products and Services Division, uh, division at the National Australia Bank. Yes, that's right. And have you received a summons to attend and give evidence today? I uh have. -huh. Do you have that summons with you? Uh, perhaps only momentarily. Huh? Might I tender the summons, Commissioner? You had 1.19 summons to Mr Gilfillan, yes. And uh, were you asked by solicitors assisting the Commission to prepare a witness statement on a number of given topics. Yes. And have you done so? Yes, I have. Do you have that statement with you? Yes, I do. And is that the statement dated 5th of March and signed by you? Yes, it is. I tender that statement. Exhibit 1.20, Statement of Angus Strew and Christopher Gilfillan of 5 March 2018. Statement or statement and exhibits? Uh, I was going to t proceed to the exhibits, Commissioner, but we can t tender them together if it suits. Oh, a matter yes. of supreme indifference, sorry. Uh, then uh, can we also tender the 36 exhibits which are referred to in that statement? That can become part of Exhibit 1.20. Thank you. Yes. Um, Mr Gilfillan, uh, before I sit down, are there any uh, amendments, corrections, additions that you wish to make to your statement? No. Thank Commissioner you very Fraser's. much. Ms Harris, yes, Ms Orr. Uh, Mr Gilfillan, uh, you've been the Executive General Manager in Consumer Lending for the Customer Products and Services Division at NAB since October 2014. <coughs> Correct. Uh, and you tell us in your statement that you have approximately 20 years experience as a banker. Yes, that's right. And you've been put forward by NAB together with Mr Waldron uh, to give evidence in response to a series of questions asked by the Commission about the misconduct identified by NAB in connection with its introducer program. Yes, that's right. But the evidence that you give in your witness statement is not about the details of that misconduct, which Mr Waldron dealt with, your evidence is about the details of home lending processes at NAB during the time that the misconduct occurred. Is that right? That's right. Uh, within your statement, at paragraph 8, you give evidence about the various home loans that are offered by NAB? Yes. Some are NAB branded and some are branded with another brand's name? Yes. Uh, and these NAB products that are branded with another brand uh, they're known as white label products, is that right? Yes, it is. 
and which brands does NAB use to sell its white label products? So generally it'll be the name of uh, an aggregator or a broker. Can you give us some examples? Uh, so Fast Lend for the Fast Aggregator, uh, Choice Lend for our Choice Aggregator, and we also use our white label capability to sell Ubank home loans. So a customer who acquires one of those home loans doesn't know that it's a NAB home loan, is that right? I think they generally would know because it's in the letter of offer that stipulates that NAB is, is the lender. I see. So at some point in the letter of offer there's something in there that tells them that it's a NAB loan, is that right? Yes. Uh, but the credit guide and the paperwork that comes with the loan is not badged NAB, is it? Uh, it's not my area of expertise, so I probably won't answer that question. Well, wh why does NAB have white label products? I think there are different segments for the, of the market, of the home loan market, and having a white label capability helps to um, serve different customer segments that, that may not be as attractive to the NAB brand, have slightly different customer propositions, such as the Ubank proposition. But the loan is the same. Uh, what, uh, is the badging of the loan important in NAB's eyes? Is it important that the badging not be NAB badging? Uh, I think it's important to customers and it's important to uh, some of the aggregators as well. I important to the customer how? That it not be badged a NAB loan? I think, I think sometimes they're just... It's a slightly different proposition. It's... Uh, it is, a, it is a slightly different product to the NAB product suite, has slightly different features and sometimes has different pricing as well. So even with those different features and different pricing, it could still be called a NAB loan, which it is? Uh, it could be. Yep, okay. Um, you tell the Commission in your statement that the white label home loans are subject to manual credit decision making whereas the great majority of NAB branded home loans are processed through NAB's automated decision tool process. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And why is that? Why are your white label home loans processed through a manual uh, credit decision making process? Uh, the, the reason is because it runs on different origination platforms. So the platform through which the, the loan is applied for is different and the white label platform doesn't have automated credit decisioning capability. I see. I see. You also mentioned interest only home loans in your statement. In what circumstances would an interest only home loan be appropriate for a customer? Uh, so if during the customer conversation, looking at the needs and objectives of the customer, that there was uh, a need for an interest-only home loan, that might be because they're an investor home loan, for, exa for example, uh, then an interest-only home loan would be sold. The, the vast majority of interest-only home loans are sold to investors. And do you know what proportion of the home loans on your books are interest-only home loans? Uh, approximately, it would be in the 30s percent, so I'd, I'd estimate 30 Three to thirty-four percent. Approximately a third of your home loans. Yeah. Uh, at page six of your witness statement, in paragraph nineteen, which we'll have brought up, you sh you set out a flow chart for the home loan lending process, and there are three stages in that chart. Is that right? Yes, there are. The first sta stage being understanding customer needs and ensure product is not unsuitable. The second is credit assessment and verification, and the third is fulfilment and settlement. Yep. So when the loan application is submitted by a broker, which parts of the process does the broker do and which parts does the bank do? So the, the broker uh, completes the first section, so understanding customer needs and ensuring product is not unsuitable. And NAB relies on the broker's assessment of those matters in that first stage? Uh, it relies on much of that, but it also verifies a lot of the information as well. 
And does it verify based on the information provided by the broker? Yes, it does. Yeah. Can I ask you some questions about the second stage, the credit assessment and verification stage? That occurs after the customer has conditional approval, is that right? Uh, that's where conditional approval would be made. And there's verification there by NAB, is there, of the customer's financial position? Yes. Uh, and how does that verification work? You've told us that it is reliant on the information provided by the broker and in your statement you mentioned both automated and manual processes. Can you explain what happens within NAB at that stage? Certainly. So if uh, conditional approval is provided through the NAB decision tool, then the loan would then be subject to verification of the information that's been put into the decision tool. So that would be making sure we have a record of the customer's needs and objectives and financial situation, uh, making sure we have documentation that supports that financial position and ensuring basically that the file's in order to move from conditional approval through to unconditional approval. So what part of that is automated and what part is manual? So the example I just gave then was, was the conditional approval yes. scenario. So that's, that's after the decision tool has done the automated piece of the decision. Okay. Uh, the decision tool uh, automates a number of uh, serviceability calculations as well as uh, getting information from NAB systems and credit bureaus around the customer to feed into that credit decision. Mm -hmm. If it's a manual decision, then those actions are manual. You refer in your statement at paragraph 26 to controls that NAB had, and I assume still has, uh, in relation to the validation and verification of a potential customer's financial position. Yep. Uh, so you list some controls. Uh, and the second of those is ensuring that reasonable inquiries had been made into the customer's financial situation and that relevant income, such as income and property valuations, was verified reasonably and independently from the originating banker. Is the verification done by a separate team called the fulfilment team? Uh, it's done by the, a separate team called the uh, verification team. The verification yeah. team. In, were in, they in that once, second phase. Were they once the fulfilment team or is that a separate team altogether? It's a separate team, yeah. And does someone in that team, are they required to document the process that they use to verify the information? Uh, yes, they are, yep. And, and where do they document that? Uh, there's generally a, a verification workbook that would be followed to ensure that we've documented what verification steps have been taken. And how long has that been the process at NAB, that that information goes into the verification workbook? Uh, it, look, it varies by different channels. So that I'm, I'm aware that it is in place for all channels now, but we did have to, have to do some work for uh, the white label business over the last six months to make sure we had that work, workbook there. But I'm not sure how long it's been in place for the other parts. Can I show you a document, uh, Mr Gilfillan, which is NAB 0051220001. This is not part of your statement. Now, have, this is a document, Mr Gilfillan, that is a report produced for NAB by EY, Ernst & Young in April 2017. Have you seen this document before? Yes, I have. Uh, and this document was produced as part of the 2016 targeted review into home lending that was initiated by APRA? Yes. Yes. Could I ask you to turn to 0032 within that document? Do you see there on the right hand side under the heading verification completion sign off? Now, before I go to that, do you understand the process that led to this report being created? Uh, 
Yes, I do. Yeah. You understand that there was a file review yeah. conducted yeah. by Ernst & Young and this yeah. Uh, yeah. document records various findings that resulted from that file review? Yes. Now can I ask you to look under verification completion sign off? Now there's a reference here to the fulfilment team, hence my reference to that in an earlier question. When the fulfilment team or banker completes the verification activities, the details of the staff member and date of verification is captured in the system. For loans processed through Siebel, this also includes a checkbox within the system checklist. There is, however, no requirement for the banker or the verification team to document the process they have undertaken in verifying the financial position of the borrower. For example, a staff member does not need to document whether they have used a payslip, a bank statement or tax return to support salary income. Instead, the means of identifying the source documentation used is to review the documents that are saved within the application system and to compare these with the data included in the decision tool. Now, do you accept that there was, at the time of this report, no requirement for documentation of this verification process? So I, I, I accept that there was a need to have the verification documents included in the file, but yes, you're correct, there was not the same uh, document uh, verification checklist on the file. Has that been fixed? It's uh, the approach we're taking for business bank files is that we are, we've agreed with APRA the, the uh, remediation of this and it is to ensure that all verification activities are done by the separate fulfilment team rather than by the banker. So we have agreed that by the end of March 94% of files will be done centrally and by September it will be 100% mm -hmm. and we're on track to meet those requirements. That related to business, did you say? Yeah. yeah. And what about uh, uh, verification for non-business customers? Uh, so that this was a, an issue for the business customers. I see. Yeah. I see. Um, do you say then that the entirety of the files that were reviewed by Ernst & Young for this review were business files? No, no. This particular issue is for self-fulfilled loans, which it says at the top, and that is within our relationship channels, and that could be in the, the business bank or I think there were some in the agri-channel as well. And that was the activity we had agreed with APRA was that they would all be, we'd have the segregation of duties for verification in place 100% by September this year mm -hmm. and 94% by March. I see. Can I, uh, I'll tender that document. Exhibit 1.21, NAB 005122, 001, Ernst & Young report, April 2017. Can I take you back to the part of your statement that talks about the controls that are in place for the um, verification processes, which is paragraph 26 of your statement? We've had a look at one of those in particular, which was listed in subparagraph B. Now, in subparagraph C, you refer to another type of control uh, that is built into the credit assessment tools and processes. Uh, there are two here. Each application was submitted for a credit reference check. And when a customer's expenses were lower than NAB's stipulated benchmark, the banker or broker would be notified to have a further discussion with the customer to ensure their expenses were truly reflective of their situation. Now, is NAB's stipulated benchmark the household expenditure measurement known as the HEM? Yes. And can you explain the role that the HEM benchmark has in processing home loan applications at NAB? So uh, HEM is the floor by which uh, expenses are assessed for customers when determining um, customer service ability to repay a home loan. During the relevant period, uh, HEM was also the relevant benchmark, but it was possible to sign off a serviceability uh, waiver by a appropriately um, 
a qualified credit manager for serviceability where HEM was, where expenses were slightly below HEM. So the HEM benchmark was used in the serviceability assessment during the period of the mis misconduct from 2013 to 2016? Uh, I, I wasn't at NAB for the whole period. My understanding is that I, I believe it was, certainly since I've been at the bank since uh, October 2014. It's used now. It's still and used. And it's used now, yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. And perhaps just to um, show you by reference to one of your documents uh, how that works, could I just ask you to look at your tab 8, which is 04200259391. Which is a NAB standard operating procedure in relation to verification of customer details in a non reverse uh, And if we turn to 5944, we see a section headed expenses. What must be verified? So when applications are assessed in an automated way by the decision tool, we see there that all applications assessed by a decision tool will use the household expenditure measurement to validate that expenses provided by the customer are realistic. Decision tool will use the hire of customer advised expenses or HEM in serviceability assessment. When the decision tool alerts that the customer advised expenses are less than HEM, bankers must make further inquiry to ensure customers' declared living expenses are consistent with the customer's circumstances and representative of their actual living expenses. Bankers must record customers' response. And there are similar obligations that we see that arise where applications are not assessed by the decision tool. Now, is this still the situation? Is this still the internal NAB process that is required to be followed when the household expenditure measurement is used? So the expenses can't be lower than him in the decision tool today? Yes. And is it still the case that NAB processes uh, tell a banker that when a customer has declared expenses that are less than the HEM, this further inquiry needs to be made and the results of that inquiry need to be recorded? Oh, uh, yes, yes. You seem hesitant about Sorry, that. Sorry, I, I thought I was getting a little bit confused between the credit decision versus the process. Right, so you think that is still the process? Yeah. Uh, and you would know that the HEM reflects a modest level of expenditure for various types of households? Yes. yes. Uh, it, it's a measure that's determined on a quarterly basis um, by the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research based on uh, ABS surveys, is that right? Yes. Uh, and you would be aware that uh, in ASIC's report on mortgage broker remuneration, ASIC characterised the HEM as being a conservative measure of expenditure rather than a typical or average figure, which means that many customers will have higher expenses than HEM. Yes. Are you familiar with that, yes. that view expressed by ASIC in that report? Yes. Are you aware of concerns about how brokers are using the HEM benchmark? Yes. What, what concerns are you aware of? Uh, that across the industry there is a greater proportion of loans originated by brokers at or around the HEM measure in terms of exp de um, declared expenses. And it's not just across the industry, that's been found to be the case with brokers who submit loans to NAB, has it not? Yes. Can I, I take you back to the document I referred to earlier, the Ernst & Young report? Yeah. Uh, 0051220001 and ask you to look at page 34 within that document. You see there under the heading non-key controls expense versus HEM monitoring that Ernst & Young reported that during our analysis of the portfolio data, it was noted that a significant volume of customers <coughs> had reported general living and entertainment expenses within their loan applications that were effectively equal to HEM or within 0.5%. Of this proportion, 48% of those <laughs> loans were originated through the NAB broker channel. 
You see that? Yes. And you see that Ernst & Young described that as an area of concern and the reason for that concern is that NAB's serviceability calculator defaults to the hire of him and the customer's glee, which is the general living and entertainment expenses. So as a result, where brokers substitute a customer's expenses with him, they are bypassing <coughs> one of NAB's primary serviceability controls. Do you agree that that is the effect of this conduct? Uh, yes. yes. And the report records in the next paragraph that Ernst & Young's discussions with NAB identified that management was aware of this issue. Uh, with monitoring occurring on a monthly basis by CNW. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know what CNW is. That's the Consumer and Wealth Division that's Thank accountable you. for the customer management part of the business. Uh, and then in the next paragraph, currently this data is not being used as part of the oversight of individual brokers, albeit we understand management intend to develop this functionality in the near future. Given this alignment of Glee and HEM is potentially indicative of poor broker behaviour, we would encourage this oversight to be implemented in the short term. Now, has that happened, yes, Mr does. Gilfill, and when did that happen? Uh, I'm not aware of the precise date, but it, over the last uh, three to six months it's happened. I and see. there is now reporting to our broker business development managers on the proportion of loans originated at or close to him so they can have the right conversation with their broking partners. Um, NAB wrote a letter to APRA after it received this report about the findings in this report. Are you aware of that? Yes. And could I show you that letter, which is NAB 000623? I'll just ask that you be shown at this, on the screen at the same time, pages one and four of that document. You, I think you may have a hard copy there as, as well, Mr Gilfillan, but I just want to show you the start and the end of the letter so that you can see that this letter was written by David Gall, NAB's Group Chief Risk Officer, uh, and uh, dated the 15th of September 2007, directed to APRA. And do you see there uh, a portion of this letter which deals with NAB's approach to expenses on the first page. Mm -hmm. And we see that NAB has told APRA that its serviceability assessment of customer expenses continues to be based on the higher value of the HEM and the bottom-up detailed view of the customer's general living and entertainment expenses and that NAB acknowledged APRA's observations regarding bottom-up customer self-disclosed expenses and the industry's overuse of the HEM top-down benchmark when assessing customer serviceability. NAB told APRA that it agrees that the industry should continue to improve its approach to expenses and is engaging with relevant experts, advisors and other industry participants to identify improvement options. This work is underway and an update will, update will be provided to APRA by 31 October. Now, we don't have the update provided by NAB to APRA by the 31st of October. What Was there one, to your knowledge? Uh, I believe there was, yes. And what work had been done by NAB in response to these issues? Uh, I recall at a, at a high level that there is continued uh, training for our bankers to have the expense conversation with our customers to make sure that we are doing the right bottom-up analysis. And uh, we've implemented a expense capture tool, which is designed to help bankers have that expense conversation with customers. We, we do find that the expense conversation is uh, not always the most straightforward one for customers because they're not always aware of what they're spending. So that's why it's important to have that tool to support the conversation. And other measures are some of those reporting measures I mentioned before to uh, 
identify where different channels are having expenses at or close to him in a higher proportion that we can then ensure we're having follow-up training. Mm. So when was the expense capture tool that you've referred to introduced? Uh, I, I can't recall the precise date. 2000, during 2016. 2016? Oh, 17, sorry. Two, I believe it was 2017. And uh, I assume after the date of this letter, the 15th of September 2017? Uh, I'm not sure. There is a reference on page two of the letter to NAB's proposed actions regarding the approach to expenses. There is a table that I'll show you. Do you see there that NAB's proposed actions regarding ex approach to expenses are one, work with experts, advisors and industry participants to develop options for APRA's consideration regarding standardisation of HEM methodology and uplift of HEM benchmark. Let's just pause there and you can tell me what work has been done in relation to that proposal. Uh, so we've been participating in something called an industry working group, uh, which has been also attended by the other major banks in terms of uh, the use of HEM and how uh, across the industry we can uplift the uh, capability in terms of the customer conversation with regard to expenses. We're also uh, in the, the Melbourne Institute are bringing out a new HEM measure in September. So we're working with the regulator APRA to also consider what might be the most appropriate um, HEM measure that would be used going forward. Well, there'd be a first mover penalty, wouldn't there, Mr Gilfillan? If one bank moves away from HEM and the others remain with HEM, there'll be uh, competition consequences, won't there? I think it's a, certainly something we need to consider is... is uh, well, is need to or not is a point I don't want to stay and look at. Yep. Uh, does the fact that there is an industry panel trying to deal with this uh, motivated in part by the avoidance of first mover penalty? No, I, well, I don't, that certainly wasn't the motivation to set up the working group. It, it is something that has been discussed, though, is with a number of changes coming uh, this year in terms of uplifting serviceability standards, such as comprehensive credit, changes to him, and new measures such as debt to income ratios. It has been something that's discussed around the first mover disadvantage. The use of HEMS a widely known fact out in the market, isn't it? Yes. That nice Mr Google will tell you all about it if you uh, look for it. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, borrowers uh, are astute uh, to uh, become aware of such things, at least in some cases, aren't they? Yes? Yes. Yes. Yes, Ms Orr. What is the reference to uplift of HEM benchmark? Up, uplift is a word you've used a number of times, Mr Gilfillan. What does that mean, the uplift of the benchmark? Uh, so I, th I think you mentioned before just the level of HEM is a, a probably conservative number in terms of total expenses. So there is some consideration to oh. that minimum floor being I increased. See. So I should yeah. read that as increasing yeah. the HEM ben yeah. benchmark. And then the second action item here that NAB proposed to APRA was continual uplift of expense capture tools, e.g. more granular expense categories relating to customers' investments. I raise that because you mentioned an expense capture tool. Do I read this as continual uh, uplift should be read as improvement, perhaps, of expense capture tools? Is, is that what's intended here? Yes. Uh, and that is listed as ongoing. Has there been work done to improve expense capture tools? I know there has, but I'm not in a position to outline all those improvements at the moment. All right, uh, I tender that letter to APRA, Commissioner. Exhibit 1.22, NAB 005122-0063, letter NAB to APRA, 15 September 17. Mr Gilfillan, uh, 
you would be familiar with the responsible lending provisions in the NCCPA, uh, the act I've been referring to as the National Credit Act? Yes. Yes. And you would understand that those provisions prohibit a credit provider from entering into a loan without first assessing that the loan is not unsuitable for the consumer? Yes. And that there are obligations to make reasonable inquiries to understand the customer's financial situation and to verify the information about the financial situation? Yes. Could I just take you to one of the documents you've annexed to your witness statement, which is behind tab two. It's NAB 04200255533. Uh, it's a document called Processing a Home Loan Application. Now, I'd like to ask you about a section of this document on the second page. Uh, we have that page on the screen at the moment. Do you see at the bottom, for all segments, applications with a debt servicing deficit require minimum DCA Level 3 approval? Approval can only be considered on an exceptional basis and must be recorded in the Credit Risk Exceptions database if approved. So a debt servicing deficit refers, does it not, to a calculation by NAB that there is an inability on the part of the customer to repay the loan uh, based on the assessment of their financial situation. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. It is. Uh, it may be due to particular circ circumstances that may be temporary, though. Mm, so, uh, what are the bases on which a bank would lend money to someone who the bank has assessed cannot service the loan? Uh, it may be a something like a construction loan or a particular circumstance where there are extra expenses, where over time. Um, the very experienced credit manager has made the determination that the customer can service the loan. Mm. And complied with the legal requirement to assess that the loan is not unsuitable for the customer? Yes. Uh, now, can I take you to another document in your witness statement, uh, which is behind your tab eight? We had a look at this document before. It was the standard operating procedure for full verification of customer details, 04200025939. And could I just ask you about page 5946 of this document? You see there that towards the bottom of the page, this document records that there are additional requirements when the loan to valuation ratio exceeds 80% or the application was declined by the decision tool and the decision was overridden to approved, or at decision the decision tool provides a risk rating of high risk, very high risk, or critical risk. Uh, now, in those circumstances, and they are, they are problematic circumstances, do you agree, where the loan to valuation ratio exceeds 80% or any of these other factors are present, these are red flags for NAB, are they not? Yes, they're, they're high risk loans. Uh, and what this document tells the banker they are to do when considering those high risk loans uh, is to verify firstly the assets of the customer. So verify ownership and value of the customer's contribution to any purchase as shown in the ECL funds table, including deposits paid, sale of assets, cash, deposits using an acceptable document. So the, the banker is in that instance, in the instance where this is a high risk loan, being asked to verify the ownership of the security for the loan, is that right? Uh, they are being asked to... That's one of the assets that they're being asked to verify. Is that right? Uh, it says sale of assets. Mm. I'm not sure it says um, verify assets. Do you think that in this direction to verify assets for a high risk loan, the document is directing a banker to verify the ownership of the asset that secures the property? 
that's, I'm sorry, that yeah. secures the loan. Uh, I, that, no, that's not what I read from that. Can, can you explain to us what you read that to mean? What is the banker meant to verify for these high-risk loans? Uh, so I, I'm not a credit expert, but the way, the way I would read this is to verify ownership of the customer's contribu contribution to the, the deposit of, of purchasing the loan, of purchasing the home. So any assets they've sold, uh, the cash they've got, that they're using in, in order to meet the deposit requirements. Well, that relates to the value, verifying the value of the customer's contribution to any purchase. What do you say ownership means? I, I think they're saying verify ownership. I'm, I'm not sure, sorry. Well, is it to ensure that the bank can sell the security in the event of default under this high risk loan? So, Absolutely, the bank makes sure it does have security for all of our home loans, yes. But, but you know that it would be a breach of the responsible lending provisions uh, to approve a home loan to a customer in circumstances where the only way they could repay that loan was by selling their property? Yes. Yes. Now, can well, I... Just before you leave that paragraph, or is it saying, make sure it's not the bank of mum and dad that's put up the deposit, make sure the customer's supplied the... 10% or 20%, whatever the contribution is. Yeah. Is it any Th more than that? That was my rate of... Yeah. Can I ask you about another topic that you deal with in your statement, Mr Gilfill, and which is policy waivers. Can you explain to the Commission what a policy waiver is at NAB? So a policy waiver is, is where um, an aspect of credit policy can... Uh, a banker can request a policy waiver, which can then be approved by a duly authorised and experienced credit manager. So at paragraph 31 of your statement, you set out three broad areas in which po policy waivers can be requested. We'll just have that brought up. The first of those is a valuation policy waiver. And that's a request to waive NAB's valuation policy. And you give an example there as being where a valuation is slightly older than the policy requires. Yes. Then there's a serviceability policy waiver that's requested in order to waive the serviceability policy, such as where you say a customer needs a short-term bridging facility. And there's a verification policy waiver which is requested in order to waive NAB's verification policy. The example that you give is where income verification documents are slightly out of date. Yeah. Are these still the three broad areas in which a policy waiver can be requested? Yes. And uh, you would agree that NAB's policies uh, are in part intended to ensure that NAB and its employees comply with the law, including the responsible lending rules? Yes. Um, and lawyers, I assume, have settled those processes to try and ensure that they're compliant with the legislative requirements. Yes. Uh, and during the period of the misconduct that we've heard about from 2013 to 2016, NAB's guidance to its bankers on the circumstances in which policy waivers could be given was found in the document behind your tab 17 which is NAB 0050690446. You have uh, EXC 501, Exceptions to Credit Policy and Standards. Yes. Uh, now, does the same sort of document still exist to govern policy waivers? Yes, it does. And the document explains that its purpose, do you see right up the top, the purpose of this standard is to advise bankers on the requirements for waiving the bank's credit policies and standards. The bank's credit policy and standards form the basis for all lending, where a banker is unable to comply with policies or standards but considers a loan proposal worth pursuing, they must submit a request to the appropriate authority this authority must only be exercised in respect to specific loan proposals on a case-by-case -case basis. 
what do you interpret this reference to mean if they are unable to comply with the policy or standards but they consider the loan proposal worth pursuing? In what circumstances would they reach that conclusion? So I think that would be where it's basically the examples we discussed before. Uh, the verification documents may be slightly out of date uh, the, the, and, and the banker has a good relationship with the customer and requests that a credit manager approves a, a waiver for the policy for verification. There's no guidance in this document uh, on the sort of circumstances in which a loan proposal is worth pursuing despite the banker being unable to comply with policy or standards, is there? Uh, there's not on this page, no. It, it just tells us that the authority must be exercised, as I read out, in respect of specific loan proposals <coughs> on a case-by-case -case basis. Yes. So this is the full extent of the guidance to bankers on circumstances in which your policies that are designed to ensure compliance can be departed from. I, I'm not sure. That you think there is still a document in this form? That was your evidence earlier? Well, I, I wouldn't like to say I assume anything, but I'm not sure I, training materials would be something that I think you should check. That you should check? So you're unable to say whether this is covered in training materials, is, is that what you're saying? Uh, I don't look after bankers and their training materials, but that would be something that I would like to check to see if it's included. I assume in your position, Mr Gilfillan, you would be able to tell the Commission how often policy <coughs> waivers occur in connection with home loans. Do they occur daily, weekly, monthly? Uh, they would occur daily, yes. And NAB has had a significant volume of policy waivers in recent years, hasn't it? Uh, I guess it depends on your definition of significant. Well, in the eyes of Ernst & Young, can I take you back to the report provided to NAB by Ernst & Young, uh, which is uh, NAB 0051220001. Can I just ask you to look first at page 36 of this document, Mr Gilfillan. I just want to direct your attention to the first sentence there, uh, which shows us the period uh, of 1 October 2015 to 30 September 2016, the period um, covered by the files that were the subject of Ernst & Young's review. And then if we turn to page 38, you'll see again up the top a reference to the number of loan files that were reviewed. There were 465 loan files reviewed for that period. Uh, now, can I take you then to page 10 of the document and the findings uh, that Ernst & Young made? Do you see there um, on the right-hand side policy waivers, a significant volume of policy waivers, including verification and other policies, were evident in the files tested, 20 to 55 per cent by channel. In the absence of a set appetite for verification and serviceability policy waivers, it is challenging to determine whether this represents an appropriate level or if lending is occurring outside of appetite. Policy is not reflective of the actual practice Bankers are being overly cautious and seeking waivers when not required. Please note this observation includes the risk-based sample and is not necessarily reflective of the total population. So that was the finding uh, of Ernst & Young with the review that they did. In some channels, there were policy waivers evident in up to 55% of those files. Are they still the sorts of numbers that we would see today for the numbers of policy waivers at NAB in relation to home lending? 
No. And what has happened to change that? So we have introduced a resetting specific to policy waivers since this report and it is tracked on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. And what sort of numbers do we see now? You said that they still occur on a daily basis. Are you able to say anything about the percentage by channel? Uh, not by channel. I could give you a estimate across the business, which would be around about 15%. 15% of home loan files still include a, a policy, policy waiver. waiver? Yes. All right. I have no further questions for Mr Gilfillan, Commissioner. Yes, thank you. Before I ask whether any other party seeks leave to cross-examine, Mr Gilfillan, you may not be the right person in NAB to ask this, but uh, uh, does the uh, bank package and sell residential mortgage loans as securities to investors? Yes, it does. And uh, does it do that uh, for a number of purposes, including funding and liquidity purposes? Yeah. Yes. If a bank uh, packages and sells residential mortgage loans as securities to investors, uh, the uh, transaction can be undertaken in a way which uh, yields uh, uh, an asset that can be taken to account in uh, prudential capital uh, requirements, can it not? Uh, you're right, this is not my area of expertise, but... but uh... I'm not... Uh, don't... Uh, let's, let's get off on the right footing. I'm not suggesting there is something untoward. I'm not suggesting that there is something contrary to the rules. Yeah. Uh, on the contrary, uh, but I just need to understand whether it happens and uh, uh, that uh, the sale uh, or packaging and sale of residential uh, mortgage loans as securities to investors can, I think, uh, and this will be a matter for debate later, uh, contribute to uh, the bank's prudential capital requirements. Yes. And uh, transactions of that kind can be made on uh, various kinds of terms, I assume. Uh, but a term uh, that may or may not be available is how much of the risk uh, associated with the assets being sold remains with the bank. Uh, first, uh, am I right to assume that that may be a matter for negotiation in connection with the sale of the package? I'm, I'm not sure. So I see. Uh, in particular, are you able to say uh, whether, uh, I think we've agreed, haven't we, that NAB does package and sell residential mortgage loans as securities? Uh, do I take it from uh, your answer that you would not be comfortable uh, uh, offering some opinion about uh, how much of the uh, underlying risk uh, stayed on NAB's balance sheet and how much uh, went off uh, uh, through the securitisation vehicle? Yeah, I'm not comfortable. Not your territory? No. Uh, then I can ask the question and you can politely decline to answer it. Thank you very much, Mr Gilfillan. Uh, does any party having leave to uh, appear desire leave to cross-examine Mr Gilfillan? Right. Ms Harris. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Gilfillan, just a couple of questions about uh, some things that arose <coughs> during cross-examination by Council assisting. Um, could I ask uh, for NAB 0051220063 to be brought up, which is Exhibit 1.22, I believe. Do you remember being asked some questions about this letter? Yes. And at transcript 187, line 32, uh, you, you were being asked some questions about the expense capture tool. Do you recall? Yes. And, and at the line that I referred to, my learned friend, where I said, when was the expense capture tool that you referred to introduced? And you said, I can't recall the precise date. Can I uh, direct your attention to what appears below the heading bottom-up glee capture at, uh, in the bottom quarter of that page? 
You'll see reference there to an expense capture tool. Yes. Is that the capture, expense yes, capture tool that you were referring to? Yes, it is. Yep. A and um, does that enable you to give a more precise answer? September to 2016, I believe. Thank you. Um, now, uh, just one more question arising out of NAB 005-069-0010. which is uh, tab 17 to your um, witness statement. And uh, do you see that this is the, the document, uh, perhaps the, uh, one of the last documents that my learned friend took you to in her cross-examination? Uh, at about uh, halfway down the page, uh, there is a sentence, thank you, uh, there's a sentence that commences, all exceptions to credit policy and standards must be approved by a minimum delegated commitment authority, DCA level three. Do you yes. see that? Yeah. Uh, now, you referred, if I might lead you for a moment, in paragraph 32 of your statement to uh, DCA holders. Can you explain to the Commissioner what uh, kind of experience, qualifications and or accreditation someone holding uh, Delegated Commitment Authority Level 3 would be expected to have? So it'd be a, a very experienced credit professional, someone who has many years uh, experience in making credit decisions and has been given the appropriate uh, DCA from a higher DCA holder who would assess that they've got the required skills and capability to um, make credit decisions on behalf of NEB. Thank you. No further questions, Commissioner. Uh, anything, Ms. Orr? No, thank you very much, Mr. Gilfillan. Uh, you're excused attendance. Now, Commissioner, Ms. Orr. It, it, it is four o'clock, but we have a further witness for today who has come from interstate and who we would like to sit on uh, to yes. hear. That is a witness who is the first witness in the next case study, which relates to CBA. It may be useful if the Commission is minded to sit on uh, for us to have a short adjournment to allow the NAB representatives to leave and the oh. CBA representatives. Are we going to be able to finish this witness tonight, do you yes. think? Yes. Yes, we are. Well, I'll adjourn until very shortly after four to let Council reorder themselves at the Thank bar Thank you, table. Commissioner.